Good morning. Today is Wednesday, August the 31st, and our lesson this morning is Live Together in Peace. And our lesson is coming from 1 Peter, the 3rd chapter, the 8th verse through the 13th. And the scripture lesson text read, Finally be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but con counterwise blessing knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing for he that will love life and see good days let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile let him escure evil and good and do good let him seek peace and ensure it for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers but the peace of the Lord is against them that do evil and who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good Amen. This is a wonderful and powerful lesson we have this morning teaching us that we are to treat each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord and to let the Lord uh, deal with the revenge or the uh, uh, changing of, of uh, uh, doing, getting back at people for what you, we believe they have done. I'm going to read you a passage from the Believer's Bible Commentary. Say, commentary said, as a brother in relation to the fellowship. It said that this verse deals primarily with the Christian and his relation to the fellowship seems evident from the exhortation to unity and brotherly love. The other three exhortations called have a wider application and would finally the word finally does not mean that Peter is about to close his epistle. He has been speaking to various classes of individuals, such as servants, wives, and husbands. Now, as a final, he has a word for all of you. Let all of you be of one mind. It is not expected that Christians will see eye to eye on everything. That would be a uniformity, not unity. The best formally is contained in the well-known expression in fundamentals unity in non-essentials liberty in everything love we are to have compassion for one another literally this means to suffer with and the abomination to especially appropriate when given to those undergoing persecution the advice is for all times because no Age is exempt from suffering. Love as brothers, an unknown author writes, providers does not ask us whom we would like to be our brother. That is settled for us, but we are bidden to love them. And irrespective of our natural pre-delegations and tastes, you say, this is impossible, but remember that true love does not necessarily originate in the emotions, but in the will. It consists not in feelings, but in doing, not in sentiment, but in action, not in soft words, but in noble and unselfish deeds. Tender-hearted means having a heart sensitive to the needs and feelings of others. It refuses to turn cold, callous, and cynical in spite of abuse. Courteous. It seems to so proper that courtesy should be taught as one of the Christian virtues. Essentially, it means humbly thinking of others, putting others first, and saying and doing the gracious thing. Courtesy serves others before self, jumps at opportunities to assist, and expresses prompt application, appreciation of kindness received. It is never coarse vulgar or rude. As they suffer in relation to persecutors, 3, 9 through 4, 6, the whole epistle is written against a backdrop of persecution and suffering. From this verse to 4, 6, the subject is the Christian and his relation to persecutors. Repeatedly, believers are urged to suffer for righteousness' sake without retaliating. 
We are not to repay evil for evil or revealing for revealing. Instead, we are to bless those who mistreat us and to repay insult with kindness. As Christians, we are not called to harm others, but to do them good, not to <clears throat> curse, but to bless. Then God rewards this type of behavior with a blessing. In verse 10 through 12, Peter quotes Psalms 34, 12 through 16a to conform that God's blessing rests on the one who refrains from evil deeds and evil speech and practices righteousness. The force of the first verse is this. The one who wishes to enjoy life to the hilt and experience good days should refrain from speaking evil or deceit. We should not repay insult and lies and kind. To love life is condemned in John 12 and 25, but there it, there it means to live for self and disregard the true purpose of life. Here it means to live in the way of God, the, in the way God intended. Not only evil speech, but evil deeds are forbidden. Retaliate only intensifies the conflict. It is stupid to use the words weapons. The behavior should repay evil with good and promote peace by meekly enduring abuse. Fire, fire cannot be fought with fire. The only way to overcome evil is to let it run its course so that it does not find the resistance it is looking for. Resistance merely creates further evil and adds fuel to the flames. But when evil meets no opposition and encounters no obstacle, but only patient endurance, its sting is drawn, and at Last, it meets an opponent which is more than its match. Of course, this can only happen when the last once of resistance, ounce of resistance, is abandoned and the renunciation of revenge is complete. Then evil cannot find its mark. It can breed no further evil and is left barren. The Lord looks with approval on those who act righteously. He is attentive. To their prayers, of course, the Lord hears the prayers of all his people, but he undertakes in a special sense this, the cause of those who suffer for Christ's sake without returning evil for evil. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This primarily refers to the persecutors of his people, but it may also include the behavior who fight the believer who fights back against his foes with physical violence and intemperate language. Evil is evil, and God opposes it wherever it find, he finds it, whether in the saved or the lost. In quoting Psalms 34 and 16, Peter left out the closing words to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. This omission was not an oversight. We are living in the dispensation of the grace of God. It is the acceptable year of the Lord. The day of vengeance of our God is not come as yet. When the Lord Jesus returns as King of kings and Lord of lords, he will punish evildoers and put off the remembrance of them from the earth. Peter presume, resumes his argument with a question, and who is he who will harm you? If you become followers of what is good, the answer implied is no one. And yet the history of the martyrs seems to prove that enemies of the gospel do harm faithful disciples. There are at least two possible explanations of this paradox. Generally speaking, those who follow a path of righteousness are not harmed. A policy of non-resistance disarms the opposition. There may be exceptions, but as a rule, the one who is eager for the right is protected from harm by his very, by his very goodness. The worst that the foe can do to a Christian does not give eternal harm. The enemy can injure his body, but he cannot damage his soul. During the world, during World War II. A Christian boy of 12 refused to join a certain movement in Europe. Don't you know that we have power to kill you, they said. Don't you know, he replied quietly, that I have power to die for Christ. 
he had the conviction that no one was able to harm him. Amen. This is a wonderful and powerful lesson. No one is able to harm our eternal life if we hold it and put it in Jesus' hand. I pray that you meditate on these words and y'all have a wonderful and blessed day.